Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of the Cheeky Natives. We're super excited today. We have a very, very special guest. I'm sure you guys have seen us tweets, Facebook, WhatsApp, everything. We have an amazing guest on tonight's show. Um, Chloe, do you want to Yes, hello her? everyone. Welcome again to another episode. I mean, tonight is going to be incredible because as Alma has said, we have an amazing, amazing guest who's joining us tonight. And this is the first of many. We'll try in every podcast to bring at at least maybe the author or someone who's closely related to the works of the author in order to discuss the books with us. So tonight we'd like to welcome Mohale Mashejo. Hi. <laughs> I thought we were expecting somebody else, an esteemed <laughs> guest. <laughs> How are you doing, Mohale? I'm good. I'm tired, but I'm good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I mean, tell us about who Mohale is because, you know, I read something during the week. We've, you know, been, we've been we've been doing that thing that you do when you meet that cute guy. You and um, you go on Insta, you go on Facebook, <laughs> you go on Twitter, you send your friends some screenshots. You're like, show me, did you see, show me? So yeah, this is this has been our week. Yeah. Okay. We just want to know like a little bit about you. So we know we know black porcelain from Twitter because that's where we were stalking you. And um, we just know your your black girl magic. So who are you? We've been seeing your tweets. We've been seeing your hashtags on Instagram about black girls from Soweto being. <laughs> so who is this black girl from Soweto? Uh, okay, well, actually, you know, I've only been Mohale for a year. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, I was telling the guys at PDT earlier that I've only been Mohale for a year. So when people say who is Mohale, I'm like somebody on the cover of a book I guess. <laughs> uh, the government knows me as Komoto Carol Mashiro. Yes. Mm. Uh, born in Soweto many years ago <laughs> and um, I'm, I'm a bookworm. I'm a bookworm that happened to write a book accidentally actually. Oh okay, <laughs> so you accidentally slayed. Yeah, yeah you know when it comes naturally, slay. when it comes naturally, it's this thing, it's this thing, when you have that thing, insert the meme. Yeah, so I mean I guess this is who I am now. Mm. Um, the reason I'm a Mahali Mashaka is because my mom she lived in South Africa when it wasn't so nice, you know, and there was no black girl magic. And mm. she always wanted to be an actress. So I thought if I was going to do something where my name would appear on the cover of something, mm. or, you know, I don't know, I would use her maiden name, Mohale. So mm. my mom was Ms. Mohale before she became Mrs. Mashiro. Mm. So Mohale Mashiro is my mom and my dad, because mm. they turned me into a storyteller. Okay, so you said that you accidentally wrote a novel which has been reprinted how many times? Three or four times, okay. I don't know. Three or four times. Three, three or four times. <laughs> I can't keep up. <laughs> and I mean, now it's in a little compact with a new essay from you? Yeah, there's a paperback edition. I didn't expect that to happen because when I first uh, approached the publishers or when they were giving me the talk, you know, because mm. they give you a talk before your book gets published and they say, look, we just want to manage your expectations. Mm. This is not going to be J.K. Rowling, so just chill. And because it's debut fiction and, mm. you know, it's local fiction, like, just, just you know, manage your expectations. And they said, it, with a debut novel, especially local fiction, 600 copies in its lifetime is a lot. Mm. I'm happy to say that didn't happen. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> But I didn't expect it to, you know, move on from this big version to the paperback mm. edition. Mm. So every everything that happens with the yearning is a huge surprise for me. Oh, that's interesting. And I, I think from your conversation, it seems like your parents have played quite a formative um, part in who you are. Do you yeah. want to tell us a bit about the relationship that you have with your parents? Well, I, I come from a disgustingly close family. <laughs> um, I have two brothers, an older brother and a little brother. And my, my dad is a reader. Mm. He doesn't read fiction, though, but he read The Yearning, so... <laughs> what did he think of us? He, well, <laughs> <laughs> he said, oh, I didn't know you write. <laughs> I think that's a compliment. But my dad is the reader, so mm. that's how I became a reader, and my mom's a storyteller. Like, mm. if you sit with my mom long enough, she will have told you at least 20 stories, and then you think, oh, gosh, why is no one, like, writing these, like, things? Um. So... Between my mom and my dad, they somehow made me a writer and a mm-hmm. storyteller, and I appreciate that. 
So the first time we, we met you in conversation was actually at Bridge Books where we're recording tonight, tonight's podcast. Shout out Bridge Books. Shout out to Bridge Books. Yes. And um, you spoke about how your best friend actually encouraged you to write, to finish the, the manuscript. What was happening? Why were you not, why were you denying us why, the yearning? Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> well, I told you, I accidentally wrote something. <laughs> so in 2006, I was working at an agency mm. and... I hated it. Oh my gosh, I hated it. I feel like I tell this story all the time, but I hated this job, so I started writing just to take my mind off the job. And I spent my 20s being really depressed and just, you know, thinking I'm not going to live a long time, always trying to destroy myself. So I started writing, and she noticed that when I'm writing, I'm a little more stable. So she went, Well, why don't you finish the thing? And I was like, uh, I don't think so. So I started writing in 2006, and then in 2007, I got a job that I really liked in radio, so I stopped writing. And then as my depression got worse, I, I think I had a year of like not working. I was just basically on the sofa, either contemplating suicide or just being like, Why am I alive? So, um, she encouraged me so I started writing something else that will be my second novel God willing yes and then she said if you don't finish the first one you won't finish the second one Mm. and she basically said how you do one thing is how you do everything Mm. so I finished it and then she read it and she was like oh my gosh like like, this is a thing well done and then at the time I had become friends with Zakes so Okay, Zex so casually. Zex Zex who? Who? Girl, Zex Zex who? Who? Okay. You know she's like Zakes. <laughs> so when I was working in radio, I had an arts show. Mm-hmm. And one day I interviewed Zakes and and it was one of the best interviews I'd done and he was <laughs> he was really funny. But you know, he's Zakes and he gets interviewed all the time, so I thought, okay. It's nice, I got to meet one of my favorite authors, and then a couple of months later, I met him at a thing, and he said, hey, I remember you. Mm. And then we became friends, but I didn't tell him I write, because I imagine Zakes hears from people all the time, oh, I wanna be a writer, oh, I have a manuscript. So I didn't tell him anything about it, and once I'd finished uh, the manuscript, my best friend said, why don't you send it to Zakes? And I was like, are you crazy? This is my favorite author, yes, he's my friend. But I'm not gonna send him my chicken scratch. So eventually I I sent it to him and he was so surprised. He said, why didn't you tell me you write? I said, well, because everybody writes, right? Everybody's got a story. Yes. I'm working on my novel. <laughs> and then weeks and weeks went by and I thought, well, he must really hate it. And then he got back to me and he said, I think this is a story that needs to be published. Mm. Mm. And I wish I could say the rest is history, but... <laughs> Then there was another long thing about finding a publisher, Mm. five million rejections, wanting to self-publish. And then I found an editor because I'd saved up money to self-publish. And I found an editor and she said, I can take your money. I, I, of course I will, but I think you should get a publisher. And she, she gave me two, two contact details. And one of them was for my current publisher but I was so fed up with publishers because I'd had so many rejections that I only emailed one and that is my current publisher now Mm. well done well done so I think uh, to before we get into the book since we did speak about Zakes and uh, Muhammad was so casual about the fact that Zakes wrote the foreword to her book we're going to read yeah we're going to read a little bit of what Zakes and I had to say about Muhammad's book a bewitching addition to the current South African literary boom Muhale Mashiko tells a story with charming lucidity, disarming characterization, subversive wisdom, and subtle humor. What does that even mean? I feel like he could have just said, buy this book, it's shit hot. I feel like he said you slayed, honey. He slayed. That's what he said. He said you slayed. He said nice things, yes. I, I... He said true things. Yes. Take it. Yes. Take, <laughs> I'll take, take it. it. I'll so take it. I'm trying to... You know, you speak about your best friend and you speak about how she's really, like, contributed to you writing The Yearning. And as we're talking, I'm reminded of Unati, you know, who is um, Marubeni's best friend. And I'm wondering if, if the relationship between Marubeni and Unati in the book um, sort of emulates the relationship that you have with your best friend. Like, the sort of rock sister type of relationship and also to add on to that i think as a woman you know we always get told some very delightful things about female friendships you know how women don't have great friendships they're not honest 
what do you what do you think about about sort of the idea that women's friendships have to be all of these things that that men's friendships aren't subjected to like women aren't allowed to aren't allowed not to like each other women aren't allowed to fight you know then it always becomes like a thesis on female friendships okay <laughs> uh one Amas is very close to me i I think Unati and Marubini's relationship is, you know, is cute. <laughs> but if I was to compare it to the person who literally saved my life on many occasions, I think um, every good relationship I write about in this book is based on my relationship with Mas. Mm. <laughs> so she, if I'm trying to write about a good relationship where, where people are, are like nice to each other, mm. I think of how she is with me and... That I think that helps me write love better because I'm not very good at writing love. Mm-hmm. So knowing her <laughs> helps me write love a little better. Shout out to her. Shout out, Mars. <laughs> hey, Mars. Um, so so was, your second question yeah. about female friendships. Oh, there's so much pressure put on women, you know. Like, nice. um, I like unlikable women. Yes. I like writing unlikable mm. women because I think... You know, there's the women don't get along, but on the other side, there's people who are so desperate to prove mm. that we do. Mm. Whereas I'm just like, just give us range, just give us space. If mm. women don't like each other, that's okay. Men mm. are literally fighting wars at the moment right? because they don't like each other. It's okay. Mm. And if women do like each other, I don't think it should be like, look what we're doing. You don't, you don't get a cookie for being a good person mm. or for, for loving or liking other people. Mm. I think it's a natural thing, you know? Speaking about characters in the book, we need to talk about Pierre. Like, who is Pierre based? Is Pierre based on a real person? Like, because I'm imagining, I sat there and you described Pierre, and I was like, can Pierre just maybe come past Barra one day? You know, where, where, where do I find a Pierre? Where do I find a Pierre? I wish I had never <laughs> written this character because every time people talk to me about this book, is but who is Pierre based on? I can't tell you, I've never had a Pierre in my life. I took all the wonderful things from all my horrible exes and I made it into one wonderful man. Okay. Okay. Hmm. And I'm sure, I'm sure there are men like that. I just, I've not met one. <laughs> so I had to improvise. If you're listening. <laughs> Hashtag. I had yeah. to Frankenstein my exes. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm sure there are wonderful men like Pierre, but I, and I don't even think he's wonderful, actually. I think he's pretty, but I think he's also full of shit. Aren't we all though? What what I'm saying is people I think people like him because he's pretty. <laughs> he's pretty. But pretty they privileged, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. They're like, oh my god, he's got beautiful eyes. But I mean you, you set us up for that. The way you described Pierce, you described him like caramel chocolate. Who doesn't like chocolates? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I think when you first meet somebody, all you see is like this amazingness, mm-hmm. right? And I was trying to, to bring that across that mm-hmm. when she met him, mm-hmm. she saw this amazingness. But as time goes on, she's like, actually he's a little rubbish. Like he's <laughs> leading his friend on. Mm. She read him like a book. Like I was rereading that scene and I I, I felt snatched for Pierre. <laughs> When she's like, don't, don't ever do that to your friend again. And I think it's such an, such an important thing. Like, honesty. I think sometimes in relationships, we have this idea that, like, relationships are nice when we're beautiful and we're getting along. And we're, but, but sometimes love is honesty. And sometimes, sometimes I'm going to snatch your wig and let you know that, yeah, no, but friend. And sometimes you need to look at your boyfriend and be like, you're a little rubbish. You yeah. are a little rubbish. I still have a very soft spot for Pierre. So, so I'm just not I'm not gonna let you But I you think know. also for me what's important is like him coming from like a not a traditional South African perspective mm, mm. and having to go into Maribeni's family mm. and having to go through the wedding ceremonials. Mm. Like just like the willingness of someone to be like, Look, I love Maribeni and I love this woman and I'm willing to try it out. Like whatever it, it we require to do, I'm willing to do that. And I feel like it speaks um, so importantly about one, I guess, different cultures and relationships, but also like different nationalities mm. about how love can exist when we understand each other. And as Alma said, when we start speaking, when, it, when we have honest conversations about, well, this is what I expect to happen and this is what is not happening. But also it's about Pierre being the right kind of foreigner. Exactly, foreign. I was about to say that. That Pierre Pierre's the right kind of foreign. I mean You know, so people like welcome him there. Yeah. Like, Do you want to learn about the culture? Do you know what I'm saying? Unless his husband has yeah. is free, yes. he's from Malawi and, yes. and then, like mm, yes. uh-huh. you know, he's trying to marry my daughter for citizenship. I mean, yeah. hello? What But I think it's an important conversation, right? To mm. to speak about how we have this idea of the right type of foreigner. 
you know, because Pierre had some bit of French and see, Moroccan uh, blood. He was exotic. He was exotic. He was exotic. But exotic. someone from, from Kenya or from Malawi. Ghana or Malawi who would speak a, a French language, like the same as, um, let's say, Pierre, would be treated differently mm. because they are the wrong type of foreigner. But it was also, I think, that whole, so Unati, her husband, and Unati's mom, for me, it was also just an interesting introspection in the relationships that people have with their mothers, right? I mean, when Unasi, when Unasi comes to the point of realization that there's just nothing she's ever going to do that is going to please her mother, mm. and sometimes that's okay, you know, mm. and, and it's so powerful because we have, I think people have accepted that people have problematic relationships with their fathers. We're okay with that. It's a little bit more taboo to have a problematic relationship with your mother or to be disapproving of things that your mother does, you know, so... And I mean, to speak... Which is why Marubini's mom is so unlikable in the beginning, mm. right? And I wanted her to have a bad relationship with her mother because I think girls are judged harshly for having mm. bad relationships. And you know what? Sometimes your mom is toxic and mm. sometimes you need to remove yourself from that. But I think also once you learn that your mom is a human being and she went through the most, mm -hmm. then you start to understand each other a little better. Not to say that all problematic moms you know, are that way because they're secretly a good person. But it's just like looking at those relationships and I really just wanted to write about women and how they relate to each other. Mm. And I think like for me it's important because I relate really strongly because I have a very, very difficult relationship with my mom. And, and, and we need to have these honest discussions and these honest conversations about like, you know, like Unati, I feel like I could do anything in the world and I would still not be good enough for my mom. Yeah. So I think it's an, it was an important story for me to relate so deeply with a character to be like, well, I know what she's going through, that there's nothing that you can do that will get the approval of your mom. I think we also need to start talking honestly about black parents loving you a little too hard mm. and that love can sometimes feel like ownership. Mm. You know, mm. where they just won't let you even when you're an adult, mm. you know, you can only marry a certain way, you can mm. only have kids a certain way. And I do feel like we need to start looking at how when black parents love you, mm. they love you in a way that they understand, which is ownership. Mm. Mm. And also I think um, what was particularly for me striking was, was secrets, you know? And that was such a prevailing theme in, in, the, in, the, in the book. And, and sometimes, you know, I feel like Marubini's mom and her family kept the secrets the way that they did because they felt like this was their best way to love her, you know, and to, and, and to protect her, I suppose. But it was interesting, you know, to see how, how destructive secrets can be. I mean, her mom sat with that for decades, right, and carried... I, I even feel like her grandfather died because of the weight of that, of that, of that event, you know? But, I mean, South Africa is one big... One big vault of secrets, actually. It is, it is. We are so full of secrets. I mean, even now in the democracy, there's things that <laughs> we don't really know. just need to unpack. <laughs> like, there's things we don't know about each other. There's mm. things we don't know about the country. I mean, I often think about my, my family and other people's families, how we came out of the 80s and there were families that had people missing mm. and they still haven't found those people. Mm. And the people who did those things were out there somewhere mm. living their best lives. And I feel like this country is very good at not talking about the ugly thing. Mm. Whether the ugly thing is poverty or anti-blackness mm. or, mm. or like sexism or the fact that this country really doesn't like women. We, mm. don't, we don't talk about those mm. things. Instead, we want to make Dudu really happy and keep holding hands and singing mm. that awful song, South Africa, we love you, <laughs> instead of actually just working our stuff mm. out. Mm. And I think, yeah, so for like the secrets, I mean, it's not only um, the first... There are two secrets, right? So it's a secret that actually I feel like leads to Marubeni's mom being the way that she is, you know, yeah. when we compare to the garden. Mm -hmm. It's because she's been holding on to the first secret mm -hmm. and then now later on she holds on to another secret, all in the protection of, of, mm -hmm. of people we love. And I feel like sometimes as parents, you know, your parents want to say, we know best. But I feel like sometimes it's a lie. They have, we need to, they need to tell us so we can make our own decisions about these type of things. Because, I mean, it's interesting how the book progresses because on the one hand, we're thinking because, ah, hua tuasa, Mahubeni is going to be tuasaring, mm -hmm. right? But when, 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 we, when we get to the truth, we're like, oh, actually, 
it's much deeper than we thought, mm. right? And I think another conversation that comes from that is you spoke earlier about depression, you know, and how you were struggling with that. And I think it also is 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 a is a prevailing theme in the book mm. where we don't talk about suicide. Um, seriously and about mental health and about depression we don't have honest conversations about them what we do is like ah it's a white thing that thing ah you're just moody so I want to know what your your thoughts are on that uh, two weeks ago I had people that came to visit me and they they were looking at my stuff things in my home and they were saying oh that's really nice and I said well I didn't think I was going to live past 30 so now that I am 34 I'm trying to collect nice things and make a home mm. And it was very uncomfortable. They were like, oh, what, were you sick? I said, yeah, I'm still sick. I have a mental illness that makes me want to kill myself occasionally. And people were just like, oh. And I said to them, no, it's okay. It's not, a, it's a bad thing. Look, it's a bad thing, my mental illness, but it's not a bad thing to talk about it. And I realized that it makes people uncomfortable. But had I said, you know, I, I, I had cancer and I made it and now I'm ready to live. Nobody would have been like, oh, they would have been like, oh, you're so strong. Oh, my God. Mm. Fuck cancer or whatever. But no one is saying <laughs> fuck depression. Yeah, so yeah. I do think that in a country where we don't talk about the bad things, the big bad things, mm. we also don't talk about the, the personal bad things. And I don't think it's just it's just with black people mm. because I have a friend and he suffers from very bad depression and blah 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 and his family doesn't understand it as well and he he's not black but i i do think that south africans need to start talking i think it's also so much more pertinent with us i think as black people just because the idea of generational trauma has has you know recently come into the fore you know the idea that people who have suffered centuries of colonization subjugation and now apartheid cannot possibly have just gone through all of that and then be expected to just, you know, dust ourselves, pull ourselves up by bootstraps and then continue to live and then we continue to exist in these systems. It's not like now oppression has stopped, you know. Those systems are ever-changing, they're evolving and we, and we don't talk about those things. We don't talk about what it means for your mother, like in Marubini's case, for your mother to have endured the, the violent death of your husband to then have to be thrown into this world as a, as a single mother and all the stigma that being a single parent carries, right? Mm. And then to have had your child endure the trauma that she had and then to have lost your father. We don't talk about what that kind of trauma means for somebody and what it means to also the whole strong black woman, the strong black superwoman and what that does for black women's psyche because it means that there's no room for you to, to be fragile. You know, imagine if Marubini's mother had actually been allowed the room to sit and be like, like you guys but but I'm not dealing I'm not coping you know I don't think she would have been given that room this was in the 80s there were mm. no there's no support structure I mean I, I think of like myself as well mm. it's 2017 I mm. have a mental illness but I do feel as though there aren't that many support structures mm. unless I'm in private health care otherwise yes. all I do is I go to the clinic that opens at 7 30 in my exactly. neighborhood and I wait and I see the psychiatric nurse and I do an interview and maybe I see a doctor once in a while and then I get put on medication. It's just, we do not have the, the systems even now. In and place. I feel like even when Marubini, you know, she's a modern woman, even yeah. in the modern world, she was not able to get the help mm. that she needed until she went back into her past. Mm. Yeah. And you know, all those repressed we memories, We just right? don't have the support systems in our friendships, in our families, mm. from the government, from look capitalism is set up to break us mm. so we're, we're, we're fucked mm. and this is why i'm saying we need to start talking and we need we to really start do. talking honestly and i think so for me it's also this idea of like a collective complacency right mm. so there's this particular scene mm. where mariboni goes missing as a child and everyone knows where to look you know they they went to that uh caretaker's place first and, 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 and it speaks about just the, the us as a community of we know the rapists in our, in our streets, we know the murderers, we know the, the pedophiles, but we are complacent. Like we aren't protecting our children enough. We aren't calling the police and telling the police like, look, you need to get these people out of here because there are children here. Because like, you know, the recent events that has happened with Rest in Peace Karabo, um, for me, my problem was, was like, as black women in this country, I don't, I don't know how you do it. Mm. Like, I just, I don't know how you do it. How do you wake up every day and just live where 
walking out your door could lead to your death. But, you know, reading that scene, again, because I reread the book, you know, in anticipation of this uh, podcast. I and still haven't read the book. So okay, <laughs> you, you wrote, wrote the it. book. You wrote the book. <laughs> we forgive you. And 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 I remember saying to Tloke as we were preparing, right, that that rape culture is so prevalent in this country, and it's particularly prevalent because people want to make it outside of themselves. So in that scene where they go to this man's house, right, and and he says, "No, I'm not going to let you in." There were so many striking things about that scene. I know, right? They were negotiating literally with, with, with a, with with a, a rapist, pedophile. right? They were. <laughs> and if you think about it, everybody in their family has encountered a moment where the adults go, don't be around that uncle, instead mm. of, get the uncle away from children. Right! Like, He's a caretaker at a school. Your house. And this is what I'm saying. We always put the onus on women and children to mm. stay away from predators. I mean, and even even with his with his ex wife, right? Uh, the mother of the child, Jomo's Jomo's ex wife, who then says, "I went, I went looking for my child, and I but, knew, and mm, I found my own." Mm, right? That, that was that, that was, was most striking for me. Like when she said, "I went there looking for my own child. Instead, I found yours." Just the idea that she was also reliving a trauma where her husband had killed her child. But also, it is what a common thing on mm. one street. Everybody has experienced this. Mm. Abuse is, is so, it's, it's so common. I remember going to a girls high school and in the first year, 80% of the girls I'd met in my year mm. had been sexually assaulted mm. and we were all 14. That's crazy. Mm. It's so commonplace in this country and it's because it's such a violent country. Where there's violence, there's always that secondary mm. violence. It's like a, in a war zone, mm. you know. Mm. Yeah, yeah, sure, people are killing each other, but I can assure you, soldiers from both sides are running around raping. Mm. That's because true. Because of the violence of this country, yeah. there are those secondary things where men know they can get away with mm. it. Mm. And also the idea that if that, that, you are, that there are always going to be people, people who want to exert exerts a sense of power or you know if i'm feeling disenfranchised there's always somebody else who's at the bottom of the rung and if you are a black woman you are right there do you know what i'm saying you are right there at the bottom of the rung and it's and and even this week i mean twitter was ablaze and it was rest in peace got one and these guys were were shocked at the idea that hashtag men are trash is not a real all thing. men not all and, men. and 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 i mean the audacity for you to say someone tweeted women should be more vigilant i mean marubini Marubini was four, guys, you know? At, at which point would she have been vigilant, you know? But this is what I'm saying. Like, like, there's a certain level of violence that we're okay with in this country. Exactly. And, and we, want to, we want to place the, like you're saying, we want to place the responsibility on women. Like, you know, don't, don't stay away from that caretaker as a child. Or, and we do it with children, which is disgusting. That the fact that everybody knows that in their family, there was that one family friend or that one uncle who still came to your house, broke bread with your parents, Mm. and was allowed around you and it was the onus was on you as a child to stay away from that person and you don't understand the kind of mm. violence that they're capable of the fact that adults do it mm. and they're okay with it mm. and the fact that men go oh you know be vigilant but not all men are bad then who am i vigilant against Again, them? exactly then, then what, mm. what, what what is this monster that's out there if it's not you know if it's not mm. men and this is what i'm saying about this country we need to have the conversations mm. and not necessarily you know a fighting conversation but a, a, a really honest conversation mm, where mm, we're going we're mm. often putting each other in the face of danger and we know who and what the danger mm. is but we won't say and i think for me what has been important about this week is again like just this idea that you know privileged people like to center themselves in conversations that aren't about them you know even going back to that scene where they're negotiating with a pedophile like now he's saying oh you're violating my rights like why do you want to go here he's setting himself in a conversation that mm. isn't about him where there is a girl who's stuck there lord knows what's going to happen to her so this is the idea that we are complacent right because we are okay with rape culture like mm. you said there's a certain type I of think violence we're desensitized mm. you think about the violence that we've endured in this country mm. there's just i mean even state sanctioned violence mm. has not stopped in this country mm. we are so desensitized i arrived in germany and i didn't realize i liked night time till i dared to walk at night mm. and then i realized i've never been outside of my house at without night. a knife or pepper spray or trying <coughs> to be in a car by myself and i was 32 at the time maybe 31 but i didn't realize i liked the night 
And then I realized, what is it that I don't like about the night? Why do I get so anxious when mm. the sun sets? Because of the violence that we all know and understand. Mm. We are so desensitized that you have to leave the space sometimes mm. and talk about the things that happen in your life and have other people go, that's not right. Mm. And then you go, oh, but it happens to everybody. And they say, it's still not right. Mm. And then you go, okay, we're not having the obvious conversations. Mm. And it's crazy because... It's like a thing that even as a woman, you know when you get home, you need to text a friend because there's a friend at home anxiously waiting to find out if you've been home. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And, and you, you always think, like, if something happens to me, I need to send my location. Imagine, I don't, I don't think that men in this country have grasped what it means to be a woman in this country right now in this very body, you know? I was telling him how I get sexually harassed at work. I mean, I work in a hospital. You would think that at the top of your list, you know, <laughs> this, is, this is not a problem for you at the top of I your list. I just want to get healthy and, and harass the doctor. And harass the doctor or, or how I don't walk around the hospital at night. I'm, I'm nervous to walk around the hospital at night. I, I need to call the security guard. Or, mm. I mean, this is hospitals are meant to be like a place of refuge. You're meant to be healing. You know, they're meant to be a place of healing. And such is the, is the state of rape culture in this country that you can't even be a woman and walk around a hospital without, without being nervous or without being frightened. We are a very nervous people. We are very, very nervous. Every single one of us. Mm. We are so distrusting. Men walking past each other in the street aren't like, ha, ah, it's another guy. High five, brother. They're like, oh my God, is he coming for me? Mm. Does he want... We are so nervous. We, we are very nervous people. Mm. Because we're not having the conversations. And I think... Because I'm reminded of what Marubeni's mom does, you know, to the pedophile. And I'm wondering... Because for me, that was a... a a powerful thing right to just be maybe sometimes we need to burn you know maybe sometimes we need to kill well i just remember uh, growing up in the 80s in soweto there was a lot of burning everything was burning in this country that's what i remember and that's why i used the burning it was it didn't matter anyway if a house somewhere in soweto was burning even if it was on a school property it wasn't like the police were going to come and be like hey why did somebody burn in a house the country was on fire. Mm. Everything was mm. burning. I remember being in crèche and uh, the people who were supposed to fetch me didn't fetch me. And I walked home and there was tear gas and all kinds of wild shit. And I must have been about six or seven. And all I remember was whenever I saw the police cars, I'd run into somebody's yard and just wait. And then run out and keep walking. And I remember I was so little, all I saw were adults' feet. And I knew the way home. I shouldn't have been walking by myself, but nobody picked me up from the crash. My teacher was really nervous as well. So she was like, you have to go. And I was like, see you tomorrow. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 South Africa in the 80s and early 90s was, was everything lit. was burning. So when she did that, nobody <laughs> came to investigate because <laughs> everything was burning. <laughs> the, the whole fucking country was on fire, <laughs> man. They were like, okay, another fire there in the township. So I, so I know you're saying that like everything was burning and whatever, but is there is there a particular reason why you chose that for that scene to happen the way that it did? Like it could have been Marubini's father, it could have been her grandfather. Why was it her mother? Because I think it's always women mm. that set the fires. Mm. Mm. It's always women that set the fires. Mm. Yeah, men will take credit. All right, Nelson Mandela. But who was back here doing all the ugly mm. things when he was on Northern Ireland? Mm. Mm. The vilified woman. I'm mm. not saying she didn't do ugly things. It was an ugly time. Mm. Everybody was doing ugly things. It's always women that are setting the fires. Mm. And what I enjoyed most about, I think the woman in this book particularly, right? So Ruby's mom isn't initially likable. It's like this woman who's in... I like unlikable She's women. in your face and she's calling Ruby and she's doing that thing hey, that black like moms do. She's, she's doing like, a lot. She's doing oh, a lot. Oh, but, oh, but, I think every, every I, young I black woman has had that thing. You know? I was rereading that yesterday and yeah. I was thinking, oh my gosh, like this is literally our parents who call you and you're like, when are you coming home? Like Utlaning. Yeah. And I like Ruby's response where she's like, well, <laughs> who's going to pay that Maritzburg right? uh, college money? Because that's what we need to do. Like, I think also in subtle ways, your, your, the book also touches on black tax like mm. this. And I, and I don't like to call it black tax because, you know, we come from communities that have raised villages, right? Mm. We, and, and, and we have to give back. But sometimes like just the burdensome 
aspect of it where you have to like single-handedly <laughs> put your siblings through school and like not not just any school a private like, school a private in school. Yeah. you know so yeah so I, I also enjoyed like just I related to that part where my mom calls me and I'm like well someone's got to pay the bills and I need to do it while I'm here it's like hey, but what I live and I'm like well then they didn't know me I just think that she is initially unlikable mm. and that's okay and for some people she never becomes likable Likeable, yeah. and that's okay as well and as an unlikable woman I'm okay with that I know a lot of the time people have really strong reactions to me. It's either you like me or you don't. Most of the time people don't like me. And when I was younger, I was really worried. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm not cute. I'm, mm. you know, I'm not, I'm not, people don't like me. Now mm. I'm like, people probably don't like me. And that's okay. <laughs> because men are disgusting to people most of the time. And I they're allowed to be unlikable. male environment. And exactly. people are disgusting to each other and they don't care that we don't like them. Mm. And I think women, there's so much pressure to be beautiful. There's so much pressure to be successful. There's so much pressure to be small. And I have to be likable. I am starving. I'm working too hard. I'm mm. wearing too much makeup. And I have to be likable. Give me a break. <laughs> right? Exactly. Like, women have to be all these things. And it's, it's interesting how certain characteristics in men, right? So when a man is loud and he's out there and he's assertive, then you know this, this man is in control. With a woman, women get cold... Then all sorts of names obnoxious. then you're obnoxious mm. you're irritating mm. like even when you're confident it's a, it's a form of arrogance like oh she's women so are bitchy not allowed to be like confident. when you're affirmative yeah. she's so bitchy do you know how I learned big words because of what people used to call me adults and other people I learned the word bolshi because my classmates when I got to um, Cape Town I went to and did a postgrad diploma in advertising and marketing and one of the feedback that, were, you know, most of the feedback that they got from my classmates was that I was bullshit. Mm. I'd never heard this word before. <laughs> and I looked at my tutor, I was like, what is that? It sounds like a bad thing. I learned bad words because of how people describe mm. me. What is bullshit? And he said, well, it actually comes from Bolshevik. So you, you kind of, you're a- aggressive. I'm like, I'm not aggressive, but I tell people when they're wrong. Like, is, is that wrong? Is that bolshie? Because I will wear bolshie. And then I did. I, I wore a white shirt that I'd written bolshie on. And then I was like... <laughs> well, that's it why... It is. I'm taking it. But right? I, and, I, and, and I feel like what's really... It stops women from being who they truly are, right? Because it's like... I, I remember listening to this interview between Masichaba and, and Anele. And Masichaba was like, Anele, you have such a a manly outlook on life and that really bothered me because I'm trying to understand what is this this manly thing like there are certain characteristics confidence affirmative like telling people what you think of them is associated with men as opposed to women and women are supposed to be these timid nice supposed to be likeable mm. and that's why I really liked Marubini's grandmother because Marubini's and I don't know if it's a function of being old where you realise you just really don't have See, I like that because I made the old woman just be her. Yeah, <laughs> she but was also, her. Why and do we have to wait till we're old so we can tell people right? what a rubbish think? person? <laughs> just get out of my face! Like I'm not here for that. Why do we have to wait till we're old? And I see this in women mainly that they go from being hey, I'm so likable, I'm so likable, and then you start to speak with the bass in your voice mm. because why? Am I, why is the bass in my voice intimidating? Mm. Why do I have to be up here all the time to be palatable? Mm. And then we wait till maybe we've had our kids and our breasts are you know mm. not seen as sexy anymore and our faces have changed and then we're we're assertive mm. we wait till we're all the way at the end of it mm. then we're like uh whatever mm. why can't we be that from the beginning and that's why i'm glad you picked that up and it's it was interesting for me because i think i think your feelings about that carried into how her grandmother sort of did that whole rites of passage and empowered her i, I don't mm. think mm. i don't think as a community we have honest discussions about young women's sexuality and it was powerful to have this rural baby grandmother Take her, take her granddaughter through the through the motions, and be like, "This is this is ownership of your body, right? Mm. And this is what it means to own your body." And that was that was that was powerful. That that for me was one of such the sensible mo- sentinel moments in in the story, right? That Marubini's very traditional rural grandmother who chides her for being umdanasesoeto, you know, these township kids, sat and and empowered her about ownership of her body. Mm. Mm. You know, these are things that actually happen. So it's not something that I just pulled out of my mm. head and I, I think it was 
based on something that happened to me when I was in primary school. I got my period. Oh, period talk. I got, <laughs> I got my period when I was in primary school and I wasn't at home. I was at a friend's sleepover and her mom sat down and she had such a chill conversation about it that I was like, this is a trap. <laughs> she wants me to say something and then she's going to call my parents and be like, your child is bad. Mm. And she just had such a chill conversation about it and she said, this is wonderful, you're becoming a woman. And I was like, woman, what is, what is this woman? <laughs> what do you mean? And she said, it's wonderful, it's beautiful, you, all these amazing things are going to happen to your body. And I was like, yes, they will. <laughs> then when I got home, my mom was like, this just means you can't be naked around anybody in the family anymore. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> from these wonderful things are going to happen to your body and then my mom was like and you have to make sure that you're bloody watch 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 I was like oh my god oh this is a curse it's terrible I can't be naked around my family anymore what does this mean and it's just the different ways that we handle the transitioning mm. of women's young women's bodies so when when you're just you don't even understand the thing man and my friend's mom definitely handled it better than my mom who was like no more nudity you cover up your chest you wear panties you put out blah, 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 blah. And, I was like, and then she said does he have sex with a boy you're gonna get pregnant I was like, sex pregnant and then i kissed the boy at a church camp and i was sure i was gonna have a baby <laughs> i think what's also interesting you know on the sexuality talk is the marubini's first sexual encounter with her her first boyfriend and how like awkward it was you know like just the idea that okay now we're in a relationship and we are at this time now we need to be having sex and like not even understanding the not having the conversation and the talk about what it means like what you it's supposed to happen to your body and just like her laying there like a log and being like oh is it done now i'm supposed to <laughs> miraculously feel something is helping us transition into mm. becoming sexual beings mm. they literally say stop being naked around the family <laughs> make sure we don't see any of your filthy blood and then it's like oh my god and i could get pregnant what is pregnant <laughs> it's bad nobody mm. is helping us transition so then we're we're learning with each other and we're hurting each other and, and you fall pregnant right and happens. you fall pregnant and then you just come <laughs> home with this pregnancy that was the bad thing mm. so like I, I particularly enjoyed that because it it shows about like what happens in communities mm. right where our black parents aren't having these conversations with us so we are forced to go on our own frolic and then <laughs> we come home with children and you then they want to be shocked information from your friends yeah. as well because you're all ignorance right so you're exactly. all learning you're but it's interesting that marubini actually takes and i enjoyed that that she took control i mean this the, the boy the boyfriend was like two years older than her yeah and marubini was the one giving the directions and it's she like, was I'm like ready now. babes no <laughs> but this no 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 you must do this and this and this and and that was cool for me because i think Particularly in the stories that we've read, right, about women, like women, things happen to women. So women, women allow, not even allow, but women are seen to allow things to happen to them, right? So as a woman, you're meant to be meek and docile. You don't initiate things. You let things happen to you and you let men be in control. And here's 16 years. You let them teach you. You let them teach you, even though they're as ignorant as you are, right? If probably more ignorant. And Marubini is, is here giving this man tips and she's like, brother, no, like you're, no, 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 no. And, and that's I, what happens when you guide a young person through, when you help them become mm. a sexual being without being afraid that they're going to be promiscuous mm. and they're going to mm. be naked. You help them transition. And I feel like I wish there was more of that because when I had my period, my, my friend's mom was certainly, she was like, a woman and beautiful things and this is what happens. And, and then I got home and I was like, ah, ah. <laughs> you know, we, I think mm. we need to help young people transition. Mm. And I think also like speaking about Maru Beni owning her sexuality, you know, it's like the sex scenes between her and Pia. She's like a force man. He's like, look, I want this thing and I'm going to get this thing, you know. And I think that was really powerful for me because of the stories we've read, women aren't in, allowed to be sexual beings. Like you exist for the pleasure of the man. Your vagina is for my custodian as a man. Like I will tell you, okay, we can have sex now. So I really liked the idea that, you know, Maru Beni was owning her sexuality and be like, ah, Pia... I want the thing, you know, make it happen. And it also wasn't attached to, like, some deep metaphorical thing. I feel like sometimes, man, like, can, can women also just be allowed to enjoy their sexualities? Like, I don't, sometimes it's just not an exposition and it doesn't require, you know, it doesn't require deep metaphorical thinking into it. And it doesn't require 
50 shades. No, it, it doesn't a, require a 50 shades. So it doesn't have to be erotica or exotic. It's this real life thing that happens, you know? And I really, really enjoyed the way that, that the scenes were written in this book. It was real, mm. you know? And, and mm. not just because I have a thing for Pierre. <laughs> no, you do, though. You do. <laughs> you and Pierre, you do. Wow. Me and, and Pierre, th- this thing's real. I think for me, um, I really enjoyed the book because I think it's one of the first stories that we've read that you can relate to. Mm. You know, the 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 scenes between Mario Beni having conversations with her grandmother and even mm. with her mom, like take me back to those places. Mm. I'm like, actually, yes, we would be sitting just watching people walk. And I really, that's really what I enjoyed. That this book was our stories. You know, mm. we've read Bo. Uh, what's that guy who writes law things? Uh, John Grisham (laughs) Mm. and we've read uh, these people who have written these white stories right Mm. and now finally we have stories that are about us and for us you know you can relate to Unati you can relate to Spiwe which I thought the the relationship between Spiwe and and Marubeni was very interesting do you want to share any any insights because I mean it's like a coming of age in the story Spiwe goes from this like young boy who calls his sister to give her updates about his swimming and his sports at school a real boy eh? here like 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 a boy, a hey, ma- like yard, boy eh? he's a merits big boy you know <laughs> he's for real and and he goes to being this person that has honest conversations with with his sister about her relationships about her poor like coping coping strategies about her self harm right mm. and and it's interesting because I think sometimes even even with our siblings we we don't really give our siblings room like your little brother is your little brother you know and and you watch them grow and become shout out to your brother who's in the audience <laughs> <laughs> and you watch them you watch them grow and become their own sort of people and it's such an interesting dynamic to witness right and. I'm just curious as to why you wrote Simpre the way that you did, you know? Because well, I, I thought it would go a very different was my way. Real first friend, you know? Mm. Like, I feel like my parents brought home a friend and I was like, I shall grow it. <laughs> you know, so he was growing and I was like, yay, I have a Were well, you not allowed to touch him like Marubeni was not allowed to touch <laughs> you? So it's like, it's a fragile little thing. Look, when they first bring your little brother home, you, you're not allowed to, like, touch the top of his head. And you're a little rough also. You could break it. So it's good that you're not allowed to touch it until it's, it's a little more resilient. Mm. But my little brother was my first friend essentially mm. because he's in the house all the time <laughs> and luckily he was cute i think he if he was an ugly kid our relationship would have gone <laughs> would have gone a different way but my parents brought home a cute person and i was like ah i think this is for me and i i based that on my relationship mm. with my little brother and i think when when your when your little brother or sister does grow when you have that kind of relationship then they do go from being the person that's just doing things at high school and you kind of guide them into it's this this book is all about people guiding each mm. other into the next phase of their mm. life and sometimes some of the characters get it wrong and some of them get it right so speaking think, about guiding mm-hmm. um marubini's father sure i i didn't see it going the way that it went and no me even me and, I, and, and when I read it, I was like, no, Mahali and I must talk about, we must talk about... I don't have the answers you're looking for. I know what you're going to ask me. I don't know if her father is dead or alive. It's none of my business. That's your business when you're reading this Because story. initially, I'm like, okay, this is happening. And then oh, we find out game. that this guy... I'm, like, I'm this just like, so why, why is she doing this? Can she just tell us what happened to him? So my mother and I actually had a debate about this because she also read the book. And I was like, no, mom. He's alive. He's in Cameroon. He's hmm. doing the things. Maybe he's the like, teacher. <laughs> yeah, so I'm like, no, he's the teacher. And my mom's like, no, babes. He's, he's not alive. This is, this, is, this is them speaking to him spiritually. You know, like, okay. so he's not here. He's passed on. But it's this idea that because we don't have conversations about people and about grieving and about death, we don't close certain doors mm. and we don't we don't close certain chapters. And this is this is a commentary on that. And I'm like, no, he's still alive. So maybe. I don't have the answer you're looking for. <laughs> Seriously, I I have to be honest. I don't even care if he's dead or alive. Actually, I think he did what he was meant to do, mm. and he gave her some peace. Whether he's dead or alive is none of my business. But I see people debating about this a lot. I did not anticipate this. This is. This is a real thing. That that is a real debate. It, he is whatever you think he is. You think he's alive. Your he's mom alive. thinks you're both right. I think also just for our listeners, right, for to encourage them to read the book, can we just ask you to read we, we need, just we the need, first page, Nje? We, we need your like, vibe, Nje. That's all you need to do. Like our favorite so line. I'll give is you in my copy. Page. Why are you like this? <laughs> 
My mother died seven times before she gave birth to me. I'm grateful for that corpse that somehow always seemed to resurrect itself. My father is gone, but his smile is alive on my brother's face. There is no life without death. The two rely on each other and we rely on them for our purpose. A new mother knows her purpose when she holds her baby within her and in her arms for the first time. A man's work has its purpose in death as part of his legacy. Why then do we love the one and despise the other? Why do we sacrifice so much of the present to hide the past? Why do we take away the future's knowledge of itself in order to make the past seem perfect? My brother only knows a father when he looks in the mirror. Mm. The yearning haunts him. My mother turns away from the traditions of the past. The yearning confuses her. I speak as only half of myself. The yearning hurts me. The life in me came at the cost of another's, but I refuse to apologize for that. A part of who I used to be has vanished, and now I'm faced with the possibilities of who I could be. The yearning never stops till we embrace everything that brought us here. In our quiet denial, the yearning devours us. Hmm. I mean, I was reading a quote yesterday by uh, Togozani Shenge, and she says, you know, novels allow me to create the world. And that's what I felt about your book, honestly. Like, mm. it just allowed me to to live my childhood again. Mm. You know, to to be so closely connected and understand that these characters tell my story. Mm. Um, so, as the chickenators, what we do is we rate the book. At the, the book. End. <laughs> while I'm here. <laughs> yes, while you're yeah, here. So while you're here. <laughs> <laughs> so we rate the book, and we have a very interesting rating system. You know, so like movies are like popcorn and stuff like that, mm-hmm. and stars. Uh, we don't. Yeah, do that so thing. we don't do that. You know, we decide how much land we're going to give you based on how much we enjoyed the book. Give me all of South <laughs> Africa. And <laughs> so, um, so even before we read the book, I mean, James Baldwin has a quote where he says, "You think you think your pain is is unique, and then you read." And then you read and you read and you realize that you're not alone. Mm. And I think this was such a powerful and poignant book because it was exactly that. It was reading and finding a Marubini in yourself and finding a Nunazi and, and seeing the Makosha in your life and, and sort of having an understanding of why she is the way that she is, mm. right? And just like room, allowing, allowing the people in your life to be themselves in more gentle ways. And yeah. this is why this book was so powerful. So, with regards to our rating, Toki, what are, what are we giving Marubini? I think since so, she's going through that French look. Uh, yeah, yeah. Festival. What are we giving? We must Hale. give her the whole of French Oak. No, we're giving you French Oak. We're giving you a wine farm. <laughs> uh, that's how much we enjoyed the yearning. You, I you love have... wine. Thank you. We're giving you a wine farm. <laughs> we we are we are repossessing you of the wine farm. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Where do I pick up the keys to my farm? <laughs> when we get the land, <laughs> we will let you know. <laughs> I think before we go, um, we want to know what's in the pipeline. Wow, what can we expect? When is there another Did my yearning? Send you? No, she didn't, but, but uh, like she can send us a copy of your next book. Yes. <laughs> it's only been a year of the yearning. Mm. Um, I'm working on the next novel, but this one took me 10 years from the moment I started writing to mm. when I handed it over to go to print. Okay, but no more Sade moments. Can it not take you 10 years to finish this one? <laughs> Look, this, this we need your novel magic is door. already done. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's no, great news. No, it's not already done. Oh my goodness, no. Because then you're going to tell Andrea this. It's not already done. I've, I've just got the, the, the parts to start <laughs> coming together. Mm. Um, <laughs> I like the disclaimer. She's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. The parts, but it's done. It's done. So. It's not a complete car, so don't come and want to drive away. <laughs> Uh, the you, the carburetor you see I don't know anything about cars the carburetor and the wheels <laughs> are working together this is not this is not right <laughs> but um, it's coming together mm-hmm. um, it's got a working title but I hate giving working titles because then they're gonna want to change it but I'm also working on a graphic novel so. mm-hmm. and how's that going it's coming apparently this these things take time and and money and and hours of people drawing mm. and doing the thing true, so true. we'll see which comes first yes um i think we'd like to thank you very much for joining us on the cheeky natives here at Bridgebox, in front of an audience i think it's been an absolutely incredible time like mm. you know black or magic um 
melanin on fleek. Yes, yes, man. Like, you know, like, you know how what fanboy and fangirls we are of you on the yes. Twitter streets, on Instagram. I just think we stoked her into coming yeah. onto the podcast. <laughs> you kind of did. <laughs> We're glad you came. We're so, so grateful that you're here. Um, we're also grateful to everybody who's come. We actually have an audience. And we're super, super grateful to everybody who came. Um, Shout out to y'all. Hey. I don't know if anybody wants to ask one or two questions. We'll give you room to ask one or two questions. Because when will you be in the presence of such slay again? If you're in a bar, you will find me. <laughs> anybody? Okay, they're okay. feeling shy. They'll ask you not questions. Not even my little brother. He's probably not read the book. They haven't read the book. Right. <laughs> yeah, such a liar! Don't believe him. Um, yeah, but before we allow you to go, we have a special request from Bridge Books. We'd like to know which five books by South African authors you think are a must-read, which our listeners can get at Bridge Books using the cheeky. Yes, for a ten percent discount. Come on. Okay, five books. <laughs> My five books. Firstly, Zayton does. Way of, ways, blah, 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 ways of Dying? Yes. It's a beautiful book. Mm. Uh, Kolega Putuma's Collective Amnesia. Yes. yes. I'm not a poetry lover, but she wow. Does the thing. Yes. She makes me want to read other people's poetry. Mm. Uh, Bessie Head's Maru. Mm-hmm. Mm. Just because there's a, there's a certain part of storytelling that I feel like we're not comfortable into going to and uh, the things that we ourselves have done to other people that we need to get comfortable with. So Bessie Heads Mark, definitely. Uh, okay, here we go. Three. Mohale Mashikho's The Yearning. No. No shameless plugs. I'm trying to think. Oh, you know what? Um, Cold Case by Alex Alisev. It is non-fiction, but it's about how stories in South Africa get buried, quite literally, mm-hmm. and how sometimes it only takes the tenacity of one PI to go, there's a story here, and a family gets closure where they spent years and years and years just with the label missing, mm-hmm. and it's about closure in South Africa. And the fifth one is not a South African book, but it's in the Sadek region, so uh, shout out to uh, Titi Dangaremba. Nervous mm. conditions. Yes. I don't think I would be the writer that I am had I not read Nervous Conditions when I was fifteen. Mm. That's five, you? right? That's yes, five. that's five. That's <laughs> five. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mohale. Anything you want to say to our listeners? Uh, besides, you know, get yourself a copy of The Yearning. Use cheeky as a discount. <laughs> At Bridgebox. <Yes. laughs> You've already said it for me. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say thank you for reading the book. I, I had no idea any of this would happen, honestly. I was going to self-publish and I, my mom was going to bully her church friends into buying <laughs> copies of the book. So this is way more than I expected. So thank you for reading the book and, and being so lovely. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. 